Hi Tom, I'm here with Tom Raftery, who I think is the person who criticized me the most at uh, Le Wall Street <laughs> last year. So hello Tom, I'm Igor. I'm, I'm the bad guy here. I just wanted to start a series of podcasts with the people who criticized me the most last year to, to make sure, you know, we at least we try to get on well. You know, at least I try to, you know, have uh, some conversation going and perhaps even friendship. How are you, Tom? <laughs> I'm good, Loic. I'm good. Now, I, I don't think I can take the crown for being the one who criticised you the most. I'm sure that I'm sure there are other people who came out more strongly against you. But yeah, no, I was a little critical of the the, the web conference last year. Yeah. So how can I uh, fix this? I, I'd like to see you in Paris this year. So, so you know, <laughs> tell me what. Uh, tell me how bad I sucked again and. Uh, and how I <laughs> fix it, what I should not do, what I should do. Uh, how do you feel about it six months after? Uh, yeah, six months after. Yeah, uh, well, I, I think the people. I think people are mostly upset by uh, having having speakers parachuted in without warning. Uh, no one really minded Shimon Perez so much because he's an international uh, an international uh, politician with. Uh, a Nobel Prize under his belt, you know, uh, no one minded that too much. But when it came to the French presidential candidates speaking in French, parachuted in at the last minute, taking over the slots that were already given to speakers that, you know, we had signed up for, that's who we were coming to hear, then uh, people got a bit upset, myself included. So uh, to improve it this year, uh, I think would be to stick to the program that you sell to people. Yeah. I, can uh, I defend myself just a little bit on this one? <laughs> <laughs> Go I for it. I have to, right? <laughs> so, and then we carry on. But so, no, uh, so politics was in the program, but the politicians were not in the program, including Shimon Peres, right? And so the reason I did that is because it was so much into the campaign uh, in France that I thought it was a good experience uh, for the audience. And actually, so many people tell me they enjoyed it, like Dana Boyd is telling me even it was the best. And also, second point to my defense, it took only like 40 minutes and we didn't cut any speakers, right? We, we, we kind of shifted things and it was a big mess. This, this I agree for the shifts. Um, uh, but I think, I mean, like blame myself for one very, very big thing is I should have warned people more and I should have asked them in the room. I, like by default, I thought it was interesting for everybody, and that was a big mistake. Um, yeah. So I agree. But so no, I won't. I won't change the program ag ag again like this. But you know, a challenge for you. I, I, you know, I have people telling me, well, we saw the big mess and so on, and and at the time we we were like, oh, that's bad, and now they are like, oh, do it again. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> because it was fun. You know, life is boring, right? So we were like, fun. So um, I'm thinking about uh, having as a signature of Le Web quality controversy since 2004. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yes, I can see that. Me, what is what will be the controversy this year? Um, and I was thinking, so here's a challenge for you. I was thinking about a theme that I would announce in advance, of course, which would be um, religion and, and how they use technology. And so you put, okay. you put the religious leaders. So um, a head rabbi with a head Catholic and, uh, and um, you know, I don't know, a Buddhist and maybe an internet religious guy, you know, of uh, re internet religion. You put them all together and we think about why and how and how, how does that sound to you? Uh, well, scary. <laughs> scary, <laughs> which is probably good. Uh, I'm not a religious person at all. Me neither. Uh, so, uh, but no, it, it is interesting to see how they are using uh, how they are using the internet. Uh, to my mind, the the religious people are using the internet in very similar ways to the the people who are selling pornography. I mean, they're they're past masters at SEO. Uh, you just have to look at the, the more, uh, particularly the more fundamental religious people, and like I say, themselves and the pornographers are are experts at SEO and at driving traffic to their site for obvious reasons uh, and you just look at them for trends and where the web is going so you're suggesting religion and sex sounds good to me <laughs> particularly the second part <laughs> no apologies really uh for those who were which which uh, i i think it's it's a majority vote a uh, minority but who, who were really upset against me um 
uh, on that part. And uh, but yeah, move on. Like 2007, I really hope I see you this year with us. And uh, you know, yeah. looking forward to build it with you. If you if you can help, I'm starting to work on it. But I think right. you know, I go to so many conferences too that I feel like bored a little bit to some. And I'm not, you know, pointing at anybody, of course. I, I love to meet people and so on. But I, I'm always trying to do something fun. And last year was maybe a little bit too fun, even though we had two presidents. <laughs> but, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I, I guess there are divergent opinions on that. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> we, we both know where we lie on that. Well, so, okay. Yeah, live and learn and move on, I think. Okay, but you you'll help for this year, yeah, if I can. Well, I I'd love to, you know. Let's uh, let's get all the uh, more uh, the most vocal people on an advisory board, if you agree. <laughs> Fantastic, I'd love that. I would. <laughs> Very cool. No thanks. I I really hope you 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 you're going to help. If uh, I appreciate it, and uh, if you can come back again, I will I will love that. And let's walk on. I mean, it's a small world, right? So. I'm not, yeah. I'm not evil. I've tried to do things <laughs> and I did wrong, you know, and when you try and you do, you do wrong sometimes and so on. Anyway, Tom, tell me about your uh, very exciting uh, um, uh, uh, Cork Internet Exchange Mast. Sure. Well, uh, we're, we're building a, a data center in, in Cork. Uh, we're calling it Cork Internet Exchange. It's a, a, a very innovative data center. Uh, it's very innovative in that it's going to be, when we launch it, it's going to be the most energy efficient data center in Ireland and possibly the most energy efficient data center in Europe. Um, data centers are, by definition, incredible uh, users of power. And when we decided to build the data center, uh, we came across a couple of issues around costings, uh, particularly, particularly of concern was the fact that bandwidth is very expensive uh, in Cork far more so than it is in Dublin because of the backhaul issues. So we had to come up with a couple of strategies to keep our costings down. One of those was around bandwidth and the other strategy was around um, power. Bandwidth we just stuck up or we got planning permission for and we're erecting a mast outside the data center which we'll be selling space on uh, and the space will be hopefully taken up by wireless internet service providers who will you know, increase the amount of bandwidth we're consuming and therefore bring down our costings on our bandwidth so uh, how, per how meg. How did you get the mast idea? Uh, well, we're sitting on top of a big hill in Cork, so it, it was an obvious one. It's going to be a very desirable position for a mast because it's a 24-meter mast sitting on top of a big hill overlooking Cork. Wow. We've got full 360-degree visibility all around Cork. Uh, so. You know, it'll be the only mast in the country with a data center sitting underneath it, which means there'll be full redundancy around connectivity and full redundancy around power. Now, the other uh, innovation we came up with was we needed to design in um, power, uh, extreme energy efficiencies into the data center, and we've come up with a lot of ideas around that. The most unusual idea we've come up with, uh, and, and we're working with uh, the university on that, the local university on that, is uh, on making uh, data centers carbon neutral and going even a step beyond that and uh, getting carbon centers, and I, I'm using the plural for a reason, getting data centers to facilitate bringing more green energy onto the energy grid. Now, how, what do I mean by that? Yeah. Uh, da data centers, uh, data centers, by definition, have the ability to generate power. So, all data centers, as well as taking power off the grid, uh, and lots of it, have uh, diesel generators, and they should, by definition, have twice as many diesel generators as they require for redundancy reasons. They have a diesel generator which can power them, and in case that fails, they have a second backup diesel generator which can also fully power them. If you, if you take that, all data centers have diesel generators, and say you make a grid of the diesel generators, uh, you now have in one grid uh, a generation facility uh, which could be handed over to the grid supplier in your country. So in our case, the, the grid management company in Ireland is called AirGrid. And the, the, the situation in Ireland is we consume about five gigawatts of power. Now, there are 
two gigawatts in Ireland outstanding applications for you mean wind the energy. Country? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. We're a small country, uh, so we we consume about five gigawatts, and there are two gigawatts of outstanding applications for wind energy to be brought onto our network, and those two gigawatts of outstanding applications are being held at bay by the the network management company because they don't want wind energy coming onto the network not for any um you know not for any anti green reasons but simply because wind energy destabilizes the network if if you think about it at at two o'clock in the morning in Ireland you can have a forty mile an hour wind blowing across the country at which time wind energy is supplying about thirty percent of the demand because the demand is very low and the supply from wind is very high now if at that time the wind goes from forty miles an hour to 50 miles an hour, what happens is the wind plants, the wind farms, shut down yep. to protect their mechanisms. And suddenly 30% of the generation capacity falls off the network. And the, air, the, the network management company is scrambling, trying to bring power stations online so that you know the grid doesn't fall apart. So they, they hate wind power and because it, 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 it's really messy. It's variable and very often the time when they get the most power from wind is when they have the least demand you know they're completely out of sync so right. if you could grid the data centers together and hand control of the grid of data centers over to the grid management company you know that the network grid management company if they could bring up uh, the the, the uh, power from data centers as and when they needed it then data centers as a group could act as you know a counterbalance to the variability of the wind supply so as the wind power is falling off you bring up data centers uh, diesel generators you bring them up to counterbalance the fall off in wind energy so it's acting kind of like a flywheel so uh, uh, this would enable uh, in, in, in our case, the company who are managing the network are called AirGrid. This would enable AirGrid to bring far more wind power onto the national grid. So you're using uh, data centers, and not just data centers, but you know some hospitals would be able to take part in this, and some you know the, the local wildlife park uh, here in Cork is called FOTA. Uh, they have two massive diesel generators for supplying the park, and again, one is a failover. So anyone who has failover diesel generators could participate in this grid. Uh, we have times of maximum demand of electricity in Ireland, which is you know between say 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Right. when you know the, the the grid is really really straining uh, because there's maximum demand and th there's minimum supply. So at that time, if the grid ma if the grid management company had access to the diesel generators, they could bring them up. And that has the immediate, uh, the immediate. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? What, what happens immediately when you bring them up is the data centers stop consuming electricity, so the demand for electricity drops because the the data centers at that point are getting their energy from their own diesel generators, from one of their two diesel generators. The second diesel generator is also pumping energy out onto the grid, so you're in, you're reducing the demand and you're increasing the supply of energy onto the network. That's so cool, you're yeah. you're helping everyone, yeah. Uh, and as I say, that that helps with the times of maximum demand. But then in times of variability, you can also use the diesel generators as, as a counterbalance to stop the variability and therefore allow more wind energy to be brought onto the network. Now, if you take it a step further and convert the diesel generators from burning diesel to burning biodiesel or FAME yeah. or PPO or any of these alternative energies. Uh, you then get green energy facilitating green energy being brought onto the network. In effect, the data centers become carbon neutral and they facilitate massive amounts of wind energy to be brought onto the grid. So it can not only be carbon neutral, but actually generate energy from, from without burning it at all, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now, this is a very big strategy and requires buy-in from a lot of players and some political will as well. So while we came up with this strategy and you know it's, it's, it's we it's, by it's the way you're, you're saying we all the time uh, from we, we 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 as a company called cork internet exchange 
CIX Limited is the, the limited company. Uh, there are three directors in CIX. There's myself, there's a guy called Jerry Sweeney, and there's a guy called Adam Beecher. Mm. So the three of us have, together have come up with this. We, we've, we've formed the company to build the data center. We're building the data center right now, and you know it'll be opening doors 1st of September and taking in uh, servers at that point, selling rack space. But while we're building the data center, uh, this, this strategy is, is, is too big for us right now. So we've, we've, I, I started off talking about cost issues and the cost issues around power. So we've come up with a lot of innovative strategies to reduce our costs on the power side as well, such that when we launch on the 1st of September, we are going to be, and I can say this without fear or contradiction, we're going to be the most energy efficient data center in Ireland and possibly one of the most energy efficient data centers in Europe. I love the contradiction, now, you know, so <laughs> no worries. Congratulations, no, well, it's an amazing, uh, amazing um, goal and objective. Well, not alone have, have, we, have we come up with this goal, and this objective, but we've published our strategies on the CIX site. We've put up we've put up a number of white papers on the site outlining exactly how to build an energy efficient data center. Oh, really? So, oh. yeah, yeah, all all of the all of the ideas we've come up with and the ways we've come up with for um, for making the data center energy efficient, they're all published on the site, and we've got incredible feedback from but that. So, so wait, wait, on this point, it's interesting because you could. Uh, you know, use this as a competitive advantage, right? And say, look, you know, here is how we do it. And then, so why did you decide to like share it this way? You, 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 you it's like a risky strategy, right? I don't think it is. Uh, I, I think it's kind of a marketing differential. Uh, well, in the first place, uh, some of the things we've we've come up with and designed and we've put forward as ideas, there are things that have to be done at the design stage anyway. So. You know, unless someone else starts building a data center now, they can't really build it in, or it would take a lot to build it in. Um, some of it isn't. Um, one of the things we're doing is we're changing the racking system in the data center, or we're designing our racking system to, to, in the data center to be slightly different. One of the big areas of inefficiencies in data centers is around air con, air conditioning. Right. Um, and one, one of the biggest problems you have there is you have the mixing of hot air and cold air. So when you have the hot air coming over the top of the aisles and mixing with the cold air coming up from underneath, you get the air, the hot air coming out of the back of the servers, cooling the air that you spend a lot of money, or sorry, warming the air that you spend a lot of money cooling. Mm. So you, you, you spend a lot of money cooling your air, you get hot air spilling over the top and warming the money you've spent so much to cool. What we've done to stop that happening is we've designed our racks such that the cold air has a roof over it. So it's, it's very simple. It's, it's non-technical per se. It's a mechanical thing. We've just put a, a roof over the cold aisle and doors at either end of the cold aisle, which would be closed the majority of the time, uh, which means the cold air is contained. So it's a, what we've called cold aisle containment. Now, it's, it's an unusual strategy because uh, there are some other companies who've come up with similar ideas, but they've contained the hot air. Uh, and the reason they've contained the hot air is such that they can capture the hot air and return it to the air handling units to be chilled. We've gone a slightly different route. We're containing the cold air and we're venting the hot air out to the room. The reason we're venting the hot air out to the room, it's kind of counterintuitive. Yeah, that's completely counterintuitive. Yeah, It is. But if you think about it, where we're based in Cork, the annual temperature, the mean annual temperature in Cork, summer, winter, day, night, the temperature is 10 and a half degrees. Mm. If we, the, you know, the air coming out the back of the servers is between 60 and 80 degrees, depending on the density of the yep. servers. The air in the room is on average 10 and a half degrees. So the, the, um, the 60, degree, 60 to 80 degree air coming out the back of the servers is meeting air, which is 10 and a half degrees, and is being cooled by the room. We've got a large room with a high roof, so it's easy for us to do this. So it comes out to the room. It's cooled by the air in the room, free. We're letting the ambient temperature in the room cool a significant amount of our air for us. It's called free cooling. Mm. So that air then is taken in by the air handling units and they don't have to cool it as much as they would have had to do if we were taking in hotter air. So we're getting a massive saving there on our on our air and our chillers. How do you how do you finance all these? It's all privately financed. But did, so did you it's raise all, funds or did 
No, no, no. It's it's all the the three directors uh, of the company are, are financing it privately. And there's so no. Is there no, any other company that has? Uh, Using your own documents, white papers, uh, trying to mirror this somewhere else in the world? Potentially. Oh, but Potentially. you don't know We've... about any, right? No, we don't know of any right now. No, no. Um, we, we've come up with another interesting innovation as well, and that is the, the chillers in the air conditioning. Uh, you know, the air conditioning units are made up of, 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 of two components. One is the chillers and the other is the air handling units. Mm -hmm. And what the chillers do is they chill the water and they pump the water to the air handling units. The air handling units then uh, have the, the chilled water uh, cooling the air and pumping the, the cooled air throughout the room. So the chillers generally, when chillers are installed in a data center, uh, the guy who's installing the chiller says to the, the owner of the data center, you know, what kind of output do you want the water, what temperature do you want the water output at? And the data center owner will say, what standard the technician will say about six degrees. The data center owner will say, or sorry, the installation engineer will go, grand, no problem, tick, 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 six degrees, set at that, close up the chiller, walk away. From then on, the chilled water will come out of the chiller at six degrees. We looked at this design and we said, this is crazy. You need to have, because, you know, because the ambient temperature changes, you know, day, night, summer, winter. So you need to have a dynamic feedback to those chillers. So we've come up with a system where we've got dynamic feedback to the chillers so that the water coming out of the chillers is maximized in terms of its temperature. We don't want it to be six degrees because it, it takes a lot of energy to chill the water to six degrees. At times on hot days, it'll need to be six degrees. But for the most part, we want to come out around eight or nine degrees or as high as we can possibly make it such that the air in the room or the air going into the servers is the, what we want. We want the air going to the servers to be between 19 and 21 degrees, which is optimum. Mm. So we've got a constant feedback mechanism in place to tell the chillers what temperature to chill the water to. Now, this is a number of savings. The immediate saving is obviously we don't need as much energy to chill the water. But another thing that happens when you chill the water in the chillers is you cause condensation in the room. Yep. Particularly, you cause condensation in the air handling unit. And that's standard because it happens all the time because you're getting the six degree water. If we're reducing the condensation, which we are because we've got higher temperature water coming out, we don't have as much condensation. And this has a lot of knock on savings for us as well. Uh, typically in an air handling unit, because of the condensation, you've got to uh, rehumidify the air because condensation is taking water out of the air. The air is getting drier. And as a result, well, optimum humidity in a data center is 45% humidity. Above that, you start to get corrosion, and below that, you start to get ele electrostatic issues. Mm -hmm. So 45% is the correct or the, the optimum relative humidity. So in, in most air handling units, you have to humidify the air because of the condensation issues. Now, humidifying the air basically means you're boiling water, yep. creating steam. Boiling water... You have to heat the water, so you've got energy issues there. And then because of the heat, you've got to cool that heat you've just created, so that's more energy issues. So by reducing the condensation, we're reducing the need to humidify, and therefore we're reducing the energy costs at that site as well as on the chiller, just by simply putting a dynamic feedback mechanism in place back to the chiller units. There's another saving, another saving here again, uh, and this is that the the people who make the chillers have seen something like this already, but they've tackled it a slightly different way. They've got uh, a bit of piping in place which says if the air coming into the air hand sorry if the water coming into the air handling units is at too low a temperature, take the warm water coming out of the air handling unit and pump it into the cold water going into the air handling unit. So in any diagram you'll see of uh, air conditioning, you'll see a pipe running from the warm water to the cold water, which is completely inefficient yeah. because you know, you're know you taking water that's been warmed by servers and you're taking it and getting it to reduce, or sorry, increase the temperature of the water, which you've just spent a load of money chilling. Interesting. Why, 
why, why spend that at all? You know, why not have a dynamic mechanism in place, which means you don't have to, to bring it to that temperature? I think you should uh, get all the ISPs and the data centers use those. It's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So when, you, uh, um, when, when, when do you think it's going to be finished? You said September? First of September is, is a conservative estimate. I reckon we'll be opening in August, mid-August, but uh, we've had a couple of weather issues here which might push it back a week or two. So the latest it'll be is the, the start of September. We'll and be so you doors. bet on, uh, I guess you bet on word of mouth, to, you, you, you're betting on a lot of overseas customers coming in or mostly national? M mostly local, mostly in the Cork area. Um, I, I don't see a lot of international customers because, you know, Competitively, on, yeah. on, a, on a cost basis, we won't be able to um, compete with France, for instance, who've got nuclear power. There's just no way our data center could compete with France, either for power or for bandwidth. So, no, mostly it'll be local companies and local government as well. Great. Well, thanks so much, Tom, for uh, explaining this. Um, I, I think we should build a, definitely a green session. I mean, everybody is doing green sessions, but uh, yeah, I, yeah. I think you should I think it'll be good. ISPs and teach them. <laughs> I'd love to. I'd love to. I'd love to. I'd have no problem doing that. I um I had an interesting talk. I gave I gave a talk on this at, at Reboot, and I had incredible feedback on it. Uh, I, and several people have come up to me and asked me to speak at conferences about it. As a result, it's kind of different to what I'm normally used to talking about. I'm you know yourself. I I I work normally in social media, so this is a very very different for me. So uh, I'm used to talking in front of crowds about social media, blogs, podcasts, all that kind of stuff. So this is kind of. I, I started off in Reboot saying it was outside my comfort zone, but I'm, I'm slowly learning a bit about power and gigawatts and bizarre terms like that. Yeah, well, of course, it's very different. And, you know, it's very interesting, too, because we, we got like, I mean, I got a little bored about like the blogs and so on. We talked so much about it, right? We need so and yeah. you know, you're you're improving uh, the state of the world. So that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Trying. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. No problem, like. <laughs>